good evening, and thank you all so much for coming out. The place is packed. It looked like we were going to have to go outside in the parking lot for a little while because there just wasn't enough space to accommodate. Um, as Celine said, I'm Natalie Phil, and I direct the Adirondack Center for Writing. Um, it's really the Adirondack Center for Writers and Readers. Um, we do a lot of programs for readers and writers, and we promote the literary arts in general throughout the whole Adirondacks. Um, I have exciting news. Uh, we have just recently moved our offices to the stunning Paul Smith's Vic. Um, if any of you have never been to that place, um, I really, really encourage you to come. The, the, it's surrounded by trails. I should know how many miles of trails, but I don't. But we're surrounded by miles and miles of trails. The trails are all free and open to the public. Um, my office is upstairs, and we're now really a center for writing. Um, there's a theater space there, and there's workshop space, and it's a really, really lovely facility, and we're absolutely thrilled to be there. Um, although my office is at the Paul Smith's Vic, clearly we do programs throughout the whole Adirondacks. It's central to our mission. We do programs in every corner and even outside of the, the blue line a little bit. We do programs for writers. For example, on August 6th, we have a boot camp for fiction writers in Glens Falls. So if you're interested in fiction writing and just would, would like to get your feet wet, it's a day-long, roll-your-sleeves-up kind of, you know, we're going to get some writing done. Um, and we do a lot of uh, readings and workshops, so if you're interested, um, please contact me. This particular program is part of a four-part Native American series, and it's funded by the Champlain Valley National Heritage Partnership through the Lake Champlain Basin Program and Quadricentennial Legacy Grant. Um, part of the legacy of this grant is that each of these uh, programs are going to be recorded. And these recordings, um, video, audio, and a mix of both, will be made available on the Adirondack Center for Writing's website, as well as the websites of all our partners, and for the Le Champlain um, Basin Program's <laughs> website as well. So it's sort of, the, the idea is that this would be a time capsule, not only to record um, David Fadden's um, presentation, but also your reactions and your questions. This is sort of what were people thinking about and how were they responding in the summer of 2011. And hopefully years down, and, and maybe your daughter will, will hear this 20 years from now saying, why were people asking so many questions about this when really the focus should have been about that or just changing perspectives? So you're all involved in, in a legacy right now in a, in a moment of time capsule of how people are responding to the cultural heritage of our area in the summer of 2011. So congratulations. <laughs> um, there are, as I said, there are three other um, events. The next one is August 7th, and we'll be presenting Doug George at Fort Ticonderoga. Then after that is Joe and Jesse Bruchak. They're a father and son, um, storyteller, songwriters, and authors. And they will be at the Paul Smith's Vic, my new home. I'm hoping I can present them on the outside stage, so it will just be glorious. And then the last one will be Robin Kimmerer, who's an ethnobotanist and um, does a lot of traditional native um, medicinal healing um, uh, research, and she'll be doing that at ECHO, which is a perfect fit, the ECHO Center in Burlington, and that is August 27th. If you want any other information about any of these programs, please, they're all free and open to the public, and they'll all be recorded, so you'll be a part of legacy and history um, at each and every one of them. Um, so we're, we're really very, very thrilled, and I can't thank Celine enough. Um, when she said that she was excited, um, that was really just a, a very small um, reaction of what, what really happened. I called her and she said, yes, absolutely. And the, there was a point where I had to choose other venues and I thought, I can't possibly say no to Celine. I'll have to say yes to Celine because she just seemed so thrilled. She embraced it right away. She made everything as easy as possible. So thank you so much, Celine. It was really lovely and, and what a great space this is. You have a very special spot. And um, I'm thrilled to be able to, to create this, this uh, partnership. Um, so I've told you all of the other pro programs. And um, so I'm going to um, present David Fadden. I'm thrilled to uh, present David Fadden tonight. He was born in Lake Placid and raised in Onchayado, Onchayada by a family of storytellers, artists, writers, sculptors, and potters. Between his parents and grandfather, um, grandfather, David really didn't have a choice. He was destined to become an artist himself. 
you had no choice in the matter. You were steeped in history and cultural heritage. Um, an accomplished illustrator, artist, and storyteller, David's work has been exhibited at the National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, New York, and throughout the New Northeast. He's illustrated When the Shadow Blooms, a children's book published by Tricycle Press. He's also had imagery in How the West Was Lost, Always the Enemy, a Discovery Channel program. David's work has appeared in publications such as Akwesasi Notes, Indian Time, and the Northeast Indian Quarterly. Examples of his work have appeared in various publications emanating from the Six Nations Indian Museum. There is information about the Six Nations Indian Museum on the brochures. I really encourage you, if you're not familiar with that museum, to please become familiar with the, the wonderful work that they do. Um, illustrations reflecting Native American legends resulting from the artful pen of David Fadden are seen in Fulcrum publishing Keepers of the Animals, Keepers of Night and Native American Animal Stories, Keepers of Light, New England Press's Cave of Falling Water, Boys Mills Press, subsidiary of Highlights Company, Sleep Rhymes Around the World, an internationally syndicated newspaper story entitled The Black Squirrel, put together by Breakfast Cereals, and a 40 book series entitled The Native Americans, produced by ABDO Publishing. Um, it's a very impressive list of art and writing and storytelling. Um, all mashed together, all based on the, the influences um, and cultural heritage that he had growing up in this region that we all share together. So it is, I'm deeply proud to present David Patton to you tonight. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, again, my name is David Fadden, and my Mohawk name is uh, Ganyet Tagel, and uh, Ganyet Tagel is a Mohawk word that means patches of snow. I was born in March, and during that time of the year, you notice that the snow, it starts to melt, and you have patches of snow on the ground. And it was my great-grandmother on my mother's side that gave me that name, Ganyet Tagel. And it's always the, the eldest woman on your mother's side that names the children. And, uh, but you guys just call me Dave. <laughs> it's a little easier to say. But um, I was born in, uh, in the Adirondacks, and that's where I grew up. I went to school in Saranac Lake, graduated there. And um, when I left after uh, college, I started working at a place called the Iroquois Indian Museum, and that's down in Schoharie County, uh, about half an hour, 40 minutes west of Albany, New York. And there is the first time I ever told a story. I was 23 years old. And on my resume, in order to get the job, I put down storyteller. Although I had never told the story because I had my grandfather and my father there at, at the museum in the mountains. So I didn't have to. And anyways, I moved away and I knew that day was going to come. And I remember watching that school bus coming down the hill. 40 kids, 43rd graders, I believe, came out and they said, you ready? And I, I felt like running into the woods. <laughs> but I got up there. And I grabbed the microphone, staring at all those little faces, and I started to tell a story, and it was horrible. It was, I, I was shaking, my voice was quivering, and it, it just was an awful, awful delivery. But at the end, when it was all over with, I got thinking, you know, I remembered that story. It was up here. My, just my delivery wasn't there yet. The next time I told the story, it was a little better. The next time, a little better. Till finally, I'm at the point in my life where I'm comfortable. And my grandfather, Ray Fadden, he was um, probably one of the most well-known storytellers among Native people and a lot of non-Natives as well um, across the country. And he told me when he was a young man that he could whistle and mimic any bird. And he said, well, that was when he had teeth because he lost all his teeth. <laughs> but he said that when he was a young boy, he could mimic anything perfectly. And he bragged and bragged, and he told his teacher, and his teacher said, well, why don't you demonstrate? And there he froze. He got so nervous. And the only way he would do it is if they got a blind in front of him because he was so shy. And so he had the same start that I did. He was pretty you know, afraid of the uh, presentation. But he became one of the most well-known storytellers uh, among Native people. And um, anyways, when I heard about this event, you know, it was Adirondack Center for Writing, and I'm like, well, I'm not really a writer. But I got thinking, our Iroquois people, our Mohawk people, we didn't have a written language. You know, we didn't write things down in books. 
What we did have was a rich oral tradition. And that is where our history, our laws, our government, all of our stories are passed down throughout the generations just by listening. In fact, our constitution, they refer to it as a law of the mind, not on paper. It would be, uh, it's all memorized, like our constitution is memorized and it's recited orally without looking at a book. It would be similar if you went to D.C. and you read your constitution, all the amendments, and you're able to recite it without, look, without reading it. And so it takes a long time to learn those stories. And uh, like that, what, there's one story uh, that refers to an individual who we refer to as the peacemaker. And when it's told the correct way, it takes about three days to, <laughs> to recite. And of course, it takes me about two to three hours on a good day. But um, in that story is the one that contains our constitution, all of our laws are recited. And it's a big event on the different reservations um, in New York State and Canada, because there's only a handful left that can do this. And because it takes a lifetime. And uh, they travel around to the communities and they tell these stories and it's a big event and all the people on the reservation gather to hear it because it's pretty rare. But um, anyways, that is one of the most important stories in our culture because it is our government, it is our uh, laws, and it really teaches us how we're supposed to act as decent human beings and how we're supposed to conduct ourselves you know, with other people that are different than us. And it teaches us how to look at the natural world, the environment, how we're supposed to treat the environment and the animals, all the resources. Um, and it's, it's a complicated, beautiful story. But uh, and there are other stories as well that are uh, more for fun. And those are the ones I like to tell. And they're more for younger people that, um, you know, just picture back in the olden days, way back before television, you know, satellite dishing out of, you know, everybody's got their cell and they're, you know, texting. Before that, way back, back before electricity. Think back even further, you know, back before schools. You got these young kids running around. How do you teach them? One way is through storytelling. And it's within these stories that I'm about to tell you that it has lessons and values and morals within those stories. And so hopefully those young people will grow up remembering those lessons and they'll become decent human beings. Now, whenever I talk to a, a group of people, um, I try to give you a little background information about what it means to be a Native American and specifically a Mohawk in this, in this area. And uh, presently, I live in a place called Akwazasne, or the St. Regis Mohawk Reservation. And that's right on the Canadian border near Messina, New York. Um, and that's where my family's from. And uh, I live there. I've been living there close to 20 years now. And I, I go back and forth to the mountains to help run the museum. And uh, it's about an hour and a half drive, so I, I stay there quite a bit during the summer. But uh, anyways, to tell you a few things, usually what I do is I start at the individual level. And I already told you my name. Most Mohawk people, uh, when they're born, they're given a name similar to mine um, and that is given to them by the eldest woman on their mother's side. And like my name again was Ganita Gael. My older brother, his name is uh, Tehona Adaget. And that means he has two towns. Because when he was born, it was when my parents and my grandparents moved from the reservation to the mountains and they were going back and forth. And so in a sense, he had two towns. So Tehona Adaget was a perfect name. My younger brother, his name is Ganadillo. And uh, Ganadillo means a beautiful pine or tall pines. And he was born in Saranac Lake. And I don't know if you're familiar with that area where the hospital is. And there's a uh, lake, I think it's called Lake Kobe. But all around are beautiful pines. And it was my grandmother who looked out the window when he was born and saw those pines. And she remembered that old name that fit. And so his name became uh, Ganadillo. So every individual is given a name like that. The next step up is you're given a clan. And a clan is similar to like your last name. You know how you have uh, aunts and uncles, relatives that have that same last name. But ours is uh, represented by animals. And I belong to the wolf clan. And you get your clan through your mother. We're a matrilineal society where everything is passed down through the female line, your identity. And uh, as opposed to Euro-American, is you get all the children get their father's last name. It's like on, among the Iroquois and Six Nations, you get the mother's name. And my father is a turtle clan, and my mother is a wolf. Therefore, my brother and myself 
we're wolves, just like my mother. And so you're given a name, a clan. The next step up is you're given a nation. And I belong to the Mohawk nation because my mother's a Mohawk. Now say if my father was a Mohawk and my mother was, say, Onondaga, I would identify myself as Onondaga, like my mother. And that is where I get my voice in my government, is through that line, through the female, and through that nation. And so I belong to the Mohawk nation at Akwazasne. The next step up is we're part of a bigger group called the Haudenosaunee, or the people of the Longhouse. The French called us the Iroquois. And Iroquois is a word that is, uh, isn't very flattering. It means a uh, serpent or a snake or a rattlesnake. Uh, we didn't get along with the French too well, <laughs> historically. And even uh, uh, Champlain, the first encounter with Samuel D. Champlain uh, with Mohawks is he raised his musket and he fired at Mohawks and he killed three Mohawk chiefs. That wasn't a good start. <laughs> and so because of that, you know, partly because of that first encounter with the French, the Mohawks, as well as other Iroquois nations, sided with the British. And, um, and when the French Indian War happened, they were fighting over this territory here. And the Iroquois had enough strength in those days that we tipped the balance in, British, in Britain's favor. And therefore, that's why the French speakers are up in Quebec. If, French, if the French had won, we'd all be saying bonjour, all the way down to, the, to Florida. But uh, the Iroquois tipped the balance. And um, the Iroquois Confederacy consists of the Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, and Seneca. And later, the Tuscaroras came up from North Carolina, and it became the Sixth Nation. But um, yeah, the English, they called us the Five Nations, and later the Six. And again, we call ourselves the Haudenosaunee, or the people of the Long House. And even the word Mohawk, that's another unflattering word, but it's one of those nicknames that kind of stuck. And that name, uh, it means uh, cannibal. We weren't cannibals. It was just one of those things that, uh, you know, you call your enemy a bad thing, and it goes, those guys are so bad, they, they eat people. And then that name stuck. But our own word for ourselves is Ganyet Kahaga, and that means uh, people of the flint. And flint is that material that is used to make uh, stone tools, uh, projectile points, knives, and it's very, very sharp. And our main villages were down in the Mohawk River Valley. And in that area, there were flint quarries all over. And so, but anyways, that just gives you a little background information about who I am. And, uh, you know, again, I could spend hours and hours talking about my culture. But today, we'll focus on uh, storytelling. And the importance of it, as I expressed earlier, was that we didn't have a written language, so uh, these stories had to be passed down. And um, like Natalie pointed out, it's like I didn't really have a choice in the matter. And the reason was is because I heard it. I learned, you know, I heard it my whole life growing up. Um, they didn't say, "Well, you're going to be a storyteller." It's just when I got to a certain age in my life, I realized that I, it's my obligation, you know, in order to keep this going, I have to start learn how to tell stories because it was all up here. And uh, you know, my grandfather was getting old, and my father, you know, he had taught school for 32 years, and you know, he was getting tired of telling stories, and so here I am. <laughs> but uh, now this first story, this is the one that takes three days, but I'm gonna cut it right down. <laughs> but the reason I wanna tell this is it's, it's very, I think it's very important. It's relevant to a lot of uh, current events um, in the world today. And it talks about how the Iroquois Confederacy, or the Haudenosaunee, uh, came into existence. And this is going to be the Reader's Digest version. It's going to be really short. And so if you see me thinking, what it is, is I'm trying to, I'm skipping through a lot of parts. And uh, because in this story, there's uh, certain speeches that are recited, uh, different plots and twists and turns, and kind of these little tangents that go way off and then come back. But uh, I'm just going to cut right through and tell you the short version. But way back, uh, nobody really knows when this took place. There's no accurate date. And again, we didn't have calendars. And um, you know, our concept of time was a little bit different than the European concept. You know, it wasn't minute by minute. You, know, you go by the seasons, uh, the stars. And, um, and also, a lot of our uh, oral tradition talks about some of the past, but mostly it points to the future. And all your decisions is like, how is it going to affect seven generations ahead? 
you know, if it's going to be a positive thing or a negative. So it's always pointing ahead. But uh, this story takes place, they always say, long ago. And they refer to this time long ago as the dark times. There was a time of bloodshed. The five original nations who lived in what is now called New York State were at war. They were fighting each other. And the leaders of the time uh, were almost like warlords. And they had bands of men that would roam around terrorizing people. And they say that the men, when they would go hunting, they wouldn't go alone. They'd go in groups for fear of being attacked. When the women would go in the gardens and they'd take care of the gardens, they have to, had to have guards around them for fear of being attacked. Um, it was indiscriminate killing. And that type of killing is going on today. You watch the news overseas. You know, some of these countries is back and forth. It seems hopeless in some ways. It seems like it's never going to end. And it was, that's the way it was for generations among my people. It was just endless bloodshed. You know, one family would kill a member of another clan, and that clan would take revenge on that, the murderer's family. It would go back and forth, and that type of thing can escalate. Till finally it got to a point where children that were born never knew peace. They didn't understand it. It was a foreign concept. All they knew and all they trained for was to fight and to kill. So that's why they call it the dark times. Now across Lake Ontario, uh, the place what is now called uh, Deseronto, Ontario, it's across uh, Lake Ontario, there was a Huron village. And in that village, there was a, a woman and she had a daughter. And that daughter, her belly started to grow. She was pregnant. And she wasn't married, though. And so the, the mother in her, she kind of felt shame. And she took her daughter, and they left that village. And they went deep into the forest, and they built a camp where eventually that young lady had a baby boy. Now, the grandmother, what she, her plan was, was to get rid of that baby so that they could go back to the village. With, you know, without that shame because she wasn't married. And um, so that was her plan. Although she didn't really want to do it, but in order for them to survive, in those days you needed peop more people to survive. It was you know, a difficult life. So she waited until her daughter, while well, she was holding that baby, fell asleep in the lodge. And she went in and quietly took that baby. And she went down to the river that had frozen over. She poked a hole in the ice, took that baby and threw it into that water and watched it disappear under the ice. And then she went back to the lodge and she looked in the doorway and she saw her daughter holding that baby. And she's, this is unusual. She thought maybe I dreamt this. So she didn't pay much attention, went to sleep. The next day, like nothing had happened. She waited till her daughter fell asleep. Again, she went over, grabbed that baby, tried again got the fire, put the baby in the fire, placed wood on it, and made sure all that fire burned up. When that was all done, she went back into the lodge and there was her daughter holding that baby. Again, she scratched her head, she didn't understand. That night, she had a dream. And in that dream, so quiet this, so, and that's who we call our creator, to talk to her. And he said, I saw you try to kill this infant. Stop, because this baby is a messenger from me. And he's come to this earth to bring peace to these people who are fighting towards where the sun rises. He goes, nurture this baby, raise him to be a good man. He goes, cease trying to kill him. And so she woke up and she realized, she knew it was a powerful dream, a vision. And so from that time on, she nurtured and took care of that baby. And um, they say that he was very unusual in that he didn't, very, he didn't cry very often. And... Uh, also, when he became a little boy, that animals weren't afraid of him. These animals would come out of the forest, you know, the wolf, the bear. They weren't afraid of him. They knew he was special. The birds would land on his shoulders, and he would look at them, and it almost seemed like he was talking to them and communicating. He had a way in the forest. He got a little bit older. And they even say that when his family was getting hungry, that a deer would come out of the forest and would die at his feet. In other words, that deer was given its life so that it could provide nutrition for his family. He was very special. Now, he has a name, but his name is just so special that we don't say it out loud. 
Only during special ceremonies and occasions do you, you recite his name. But the, his name translated into English, it means uh, two rows of teeth. And that can mean diff different things. Um, one, it can mean he had a physical deformity in his mouth and that maybe he had two rows of teeth. But in our languages, are very, they're not literal like English, they're very uh, figurative. Uh, there's a lot of symbolism in our language. And uh, two rows of teeth could mean that he, because he spoke a different language, he spoke Huron, it might have sounded like he had too many teeth in his mouth. And so that, that was his name. Or he could have had a stutter. But at any rate, they always say that he had a difficulty communicating, difficulty speaking. But he was a man of peace, and he had a mission on this earth. And he knew at some point he was going to have to leave and go across the lake to bring peace to these people. And he was a young man. He was probably in his 20s at this point. And he took some tools, and he started to chip away at the stone cliff right on the shores of the lake. And people would watch, and they'd say, what are you making? He says, I'm making a canoe. And they said, a canoe out of stone? What are you, crazy? And he didn't pay him any bother, and he just kept working. He'd chip away at that stone. And he made the form of a nice, beautiful canoe, and he started to hollow it out. And when he was finished, it was a beautiful white canoe. He dragged it to the water, and a small crowd had gathered to have a good laugh. But he didn't pay any attention to them. Up on the hill was his mother and his grandmother, and he walked up to them, and he says, I'm going to leave this place, and I'm never going to return. If you ever wonder how I am, go to that tree, and he pointed to a maple tree, and you take your knife, and you scrape some bark off of that tree. And if red blood falls from the wound on that tree, that means I have failed, and I'm probably dead. But if you take your knife to that tree, and take some bark off, and it's clear, that means I'm still alive, and uh, my mission is working. So he said his goodbyes to his mother and his grandmother, and he got into that canoe, pushed it into the water, and to everybody's amazement, that canoe went swiftly across that lake, and it went over the horizon and it disappeared. Now on the other side of the lake, just so happened a war party of Senecas were coming by, and they saw this little glimmer of light on the horizon on that lake, and it was that canoe, the light hitting it. And they listened, and they could hear the singing, somebody was singing in that canoe. And so it, the way it was in those days, it was pretty violent. They were gonna ambush whoever this was and kill him. You know, no questions asked. So they hid in ambush and they waited. And pretty soon that canoe got closer and closer. And they're waiting and waiting. And then that song he was singing was very different. That song was a song of peace. In those days, all of our songs that we would sing were songs of war. You know how, like, um, it, it's songs that are used to pump people up to fight. You know, like the Marines, they have these songs that sing, and it, you know, gets you going when you're marching. It was those types of songs that uh, they sing, and it was getting ready to, to fight. Those are the only songs that were known in those days. A lot of our ceremonial songs were forgotten. They were, they were pushed aside because of war. So they heard this one song, and it was very different, and it was beautiful. It was nice. And so they listened, and it was that darkness that filled their hearts started to go away, and that light was starting to shine again because of that song. And before long, the peacemaker was on the shoreline, and he pulled his canoe up, and the Senecas that were going to kill him went up to talk. And they said, what is this song you're singing? And he explained that it's the song of peace. Then he started to set out about these rules to follow that differ than war. And these uh, young men that were ready to fight, and that's all they knew. They never heard of such a thing. And uh, so they listened and they said, this is a wonderful thing. Goes, but they were still afraid to throw away their weapons. You know, they weren't quite ready to grasp hold of that idea. And so the peacemaker asked, he said, who are the most feared people? And they all pointed to the east. They said, the Ganyat Gahaga, or the Mohawks. Everybody's afraid of them. They're the worst ones. And so the peacemaker said, that is where I'm going to start. And so he hiked around, and he found some trails. And in his travels, he came upon a lodge. And he realized that there was a crossroads of paths. And there were war trails in those days. And at that lodge was a woman. 
And inside this woman, her name was Jigu uh, Sase. And Jigu Sase, she was like, um, she promoted war. And, um, people would come by and she'd say, they went that way. You know, that's what she did. Or they say that she was, she spread rumors about other people. She was a troublemaker, in other words. And um, so he came into her lodge and she says, who is this guy? And she's right away trying to scheme what to do. And then he started to talk about his message. And briefly, in a nutshell, his message is called the Guyana Let Go, or the Great Law of Peace. And there's certain rules that were set in place to follow that do away with war. And that it's a beautiful way of thinking and a beautiful way of looking at other people that you might differ with. And the idea is that if you have a disagreement with another group of people, rather than using a weapon to influence them, you use your words, you use your mind, you use logic and uh, diplomacy. You work things out in counsel rather than killing each other. And it takes time, you have to have patience, but it can be done. You know, you don't try to negotiate with another group of people with an army right there. You know, you leave that at home, and that's the last resort. But there's a certain a set of rules that he put in place, and he explained it to her. And she still really wasn't convinced. She liked that idea, but she was afraid, that because that wasn't known in that day. And finally, what he did is he promised to give women a special role in this new form of government. And I'll explain that later. But in that, that explanation, and giving women a special role, she accepted the great law of peace. And she promised to help the peacemaker from that time on. And she said, any traveler that comes through, I will communicate the Guyana Let Go or the great law of peace to them. And so hopefully that word will spread. So the peacemaker continued on, and he made it to um, what well, is now near Albany, New York, in that area or a, a place called Cohoes Falls. I don't know if you're familiar with it. But in that, for our people, that's a sacred place. And um, just now, recently, we've, we've been able to get access to it because uh, some uh, company owns it and they wouldn't let us you know, see it. But um, at this place, there was a Mohawk village. And uh, in the old days, it was customary for any traveler uh, to make a little fire or a little camp on the outskirts of the village, or they call it the edge of the clearing because all villages were in a clearing. And you don't march right into the village. You just you make a little fire so that they could see the smoke. And the people in the village would come out and either welcome you in or tell you to go on your way. You know, you don't just barge in. And so he made that little fire. And of course, those men came running with their war clubs drawn. They were going to kill whoever this was. And again, he was singing that beautiful song. And they forgot their intentions. And they listened to him. And they invited him into the village. In the leadership of the time, again, they were warlords. They got their power through intimidation, through violence. And those leaders of the time, they listened to his words of peace. And they liked it. They said, we're, we're tired of war. That's all we know. This other way seems, you know, more logical. Because, but if we throw our weapons down, that, that'll make us vulnerable. You know, we'll be, uh, you know, anybody will easily attack us. And then they said, if you're truly from the Creator, from Sukhant Diso, so you'll pass any test we put forth. And he agreed to any test. And so those Mohawks, they pointed to that Cahos Falls, and on the top of the falls was this tall, uh, dead tree. And they instructed him, they said, climb that tree. He says, we're going to cut it down into those falls. And they figured he would say, no way. But he says, okay. So he climbed that tree right up to the top, and they made a fire, and they got their hatchets, and they started burning that tree, and they cut it. And pretty soon that tree, it fell. And then the peacemaker on the top, and the peacemaker disappeared in the mist and among the rocks down below. Any ordinary man it would, would not survive a fall like that. Nobody could survive that. And so they ran down and they looked around for his body. You know, they just figured he just wasted his life. He just killed himself. And they looked around, they couldn't find him, and they went home. That next morning, when the sun came up, they went out. And on the outskirts of the village was an old abandoned bark house, and they saw smoke rising. And again, they ran with their clubs drawn to kill whoever this invader was. And they looked in the door, and there was the peacemaker preparing his morning meal. He passed the test. So they say the Mohawks were the first one to accept the great law of peace. They grasped hold of it, and they adopted it. 
Now, it took the peacemaker years to travel and to communicate this great law, and to convince those warlords to do away with war. Just by using words, it would take a long time. But eventually, the Oneidas accepted, and then later the Cayugas, and then the Senecas. But the Onondagas were the last ones, and there's one individual that is the reason why, and his name is Tadadaho. Now, Tadadaho, they say, was the most evil of warlords around. And they say he was so evil that his hair, uh, snakes lived in his hair. And that his body was deformed in seven different places. And that he actually ate human flesh. And people were afraid of him. Anybody would be. Now, Tadadaho, not only was his appearance gruesome, but his heart was as gruesome as his physical appearance. And everybody was afraid. And he heard about this peacemaker, and he says, bring him on. He wasn't afraid of anything. He was very strong, but his, his strength was for evil, evil intentions. And people would follow him because they were afraid of him, more or less. But on the Dagon was another individual they called Ayantwatha. And Ayantwatha is where you get the word Hiawatha. Did you ever hear that word? You know, the, the song of Hiawatha or whatever? The, was it Longfellow? There's nothing to do with this story. <laughs> the author, he just, he just asked some uh, native people, who's uh, one of your heroes? And they said, Ayantwata. And so he said, oh, use that name. And so he just borrowed that name and he mispronounced it. And he called it Hiawatha. But Ayantwata, they say that he was an eloquent speaker. He was the type of individual that would get up and when he talked, everybody looked. And there's certain individuals that are born with that gift. You know, they're... they're excellent speakers and he had a lot of respect in that community and they say that the people in that village wanted Antwatha to approach Tadadaho to get him to change his mind but he was very reluctant because he was afraid of him too and he had a family he had a wife and seven daughters that he loved dearly and he was afraid well, who's going to take care of my family if something happens to me and so he says no I'm not going to do it but word got to Tadadaho about their intentions in Aintwata. And they say that Tadadaho was a powerful, almost like a magician or a warlock type individual. And they say that he could call upon the animals to do his bidding. And that his mind, was uh, he was powerful, that he cast spells on people and make them sick. And he knew that those things. And so he heard about Aintwata and what the people wanted him to do. And so he cast a spell on him and his family. But Ayantwatha was on a hunting trip. He was away. But what had happened to his family is his wife got sick and she died. Then one daughter got sick. The next day she died. One by one, every member of his family got sick and passed away. And it was from Taladaho and his work. So Ayantwatha returned to find his family gone. And in that despair and in that darkness, he ran. He had no purpose for living anymore, and he, that darkness enshrouded him. And they say he became a wanderer, that he would go east one day, he'd go west another day, go north. He had nowhere to go, nowhere, nobody to be with. And it was a sad, sad time. And um, till finally, this one day, he came upon this beautiful lake. And on that lake were thousands of uh, ducks and geese and loons. And he got to the shoreline, he was going to get a drink of water, and he startled one of the ducks, and that duck took off, and it was a chain reaction. And all of those birds took off, and each one, when they flapped their wings, their wingtips touched the water and took with them a drop. And they say there were so many birds, and each one had a drop of water on their wingtips that the water level went down. And then Ayantwata looked in the mud, and he saw these shells sticking out, and he started to collect these shells. Then he started to carved them, and he made them into beads. Some were purple, were almost black, and some were white. And he put them on these strings, and he put them on a rack. And that every evening, he made a fire. And in his darkness, in his, his pain, he would recite these words. And he said, if I ever come across anybody that has as much grief and sorrow that I do right now, I would take these strings of wampum, and they would become words of healing. One string is to re represent a cool drink of water. Now, when you're in mourning, when somebody you're close to dies, you, you have that lump in your throat. You can't talk. You know, your words aren't right.
but that water will clear it away. Another string of wampum is to represent uh, deer skin that's very soft. Because when you're in mourning, when somebody you're close to passes, those tears don't stop. They just keep coming and everything's blurry. So that deer skin will wipe those tears away so that you can see the world again. Another string of wampum is to represent a feather. And that feather is used to clear the obstruction that is in your ears. Because when you're in that state of mind, people talk to you, but those words don't come in. It, it almost sounds muffled, it doesn't make sense. One by one, he went through, and there's 15 strings of wampum altogether that were used to help people when they're in that frame of mind. It's uh, to help them. He said that to himself every night. He would go over each string, till finally this one evening, he, as he was recite, reciting these words, the peacemaker happened to be going by. And they say he listened and he heard those words. And when the Aintwata was finished, the peacemaker went up to the strings of wampum and he said those words to Aintwata. And in doing so, he performed the first condolence ceremony. And it wiped away the darkness that was enshrouding Aintwata. And his mind became clear again. And he could see, he could hear, and he could speak. And his mind was good. And he asked the peacemaker, what are you doing here? Who are you? And he explained the Guyana Let Go, or the Great Law, at length. And because Ayatwatha was a good speaker, he promised to help him because the peacemaker, again, he had a hard time communicating. And so Ayatwatha became his friend and his partner. So in those years, they traveled, they communicated that great law of peace. But Anadaga, Tadadaho was still there, that evil one. And that Anadaga Lake near Syracuse, uh, that's where the, his village was. And on the other side of Anadaga Lake was where Tadadaho lived. And they say the Anadagas, they said, well, we're just going to have to get rid of them ourselves because they knew the peacemaker was coming. And then so they said, let's go in our canoes across. We can see his, his house. So they got in their canoes and they paddled across and Tadadaho could see them coming. And he laughed and laughed and they could hear his laugh all around. And as they listened, the clouds started to swirl and a storm came and Tadadaho called upon the rains to come. And they say that there were water spouts all around those men as they tried to canoe and paddle across Onondaga Lake. But that storm was violent and those canoes tipped over and many of those men drowned, they failed. And so the ones that survived, they gathered more men the next day. They said, let's go by land. And so they start to walk around that lake. And as they were going, again, Tadadaho could see them coming. And he laughed and laughed. Then he called upon the eagles to come down and to shake loose their prized feathers. And the eagles swooped down near those men and they shook loose their beautiful feathers and they glided down to the ground. And all those men, they were trying to collect them. And then they got jealous of each other. He says, you got more than me. And because they were ready to fight, they had their clubs. They started to hit each other. And fights broke out. And before long, they were killing each other. They were so jealous. And it was because of Tadadaho, he sent those eagles to do that. So they, they could not get close enough to Tadadaho to do anything. Till finally, the peacemaker arrived. And around that time, all the warlords who accepted the great law had gathered at Anadaga. And they followed the peacemaker in Aintwata, and they started to walk around Onondaga Lake. And Aintwata and the peacemaker were singing those beautiful songs of peace. And it had the same effect on Tadadaho, is that all those evil intentions that he had disappeared because he never heard of such things. They're so beautiful. And he was listening. It was unusual. It was, he was curious. And he wasn't paying attention. And before long, there was the peacemaker and Aintwata at his doorstep. And when he came out of his lodge, it almost turned their stomachs at what they saw in his grotesque physical body. And all around his lodge, they say, were human bones all around. And they knew they had their work cut out. And so they sat down, and those warlords sat down, and they started to communicate those words of peace. And it was logical to normal people. You know, you can eventually accept that. But Tadadaho was stubborn. And uh, he says, well, I don't, want, I don't know about this. And he, was, he just refused. So finally, after hours and days of talking to him, the peacemaker and Ayantwata agreed to give Tadadaho a special position among those people. And they said, you will be chief among chiefs. You will be the only one 
they will have the ability to call a council of all those 50 chiefs, those warlords. You'll be the chief of them. You'll be the most prominent one. And that was the clincher. So finally he said, I accept. And he relinquished his evil. And they say that Ayatwatha took a comb and they combed the snakes out of his hair, straightened out his hair, and they straightened out the deformities in his body. And not only was his mind pure, but his body physically was back to normal. Now, Tadadaho, they went back to the main village with the peacemaker in Aintwata, and there the peacemaker pointed to the white pine. He says, this will be a symbol of this new union of nations. And if you see a white pine, you go down and you look at the needles. There's five of them that are bound together as one, representing the five nations that are united to become one. He says, this is a symbol of this new union and confederation of nations. Then he said, at the base of this tree are four roots, and we'll call them the white roots of peace. And they'll go to the four directions all around the world. And what that means is, is that any individual or even a group of people can follow those roots back to the source and take shelter underneath that tree of peace. In other words, they can be adopted. And the Tuscaroras in the 1720s did just that. They migrated up and they became the sixth nation. And the Tuscaroras were being uh, sold as slaves in the 1720s. And disease was taking a toll on them and outright ethnic cleansing. They were trying to get rid of them. And so they migrated up and they became the sixth nation. Uh, not only native people, non-native people have followed those roots and have been adopted. And um, escaped slaves from the south came up to Canada and a lot of them felt comfortable among native people because they were welcomed and accepted and adopted. And they were given rights as if they were born a Mohawk or a Naida or a Nadaga. And so among our people there is a mixture of all nations around the world. So those roots, they extend around the world. And the peacemaker, he moved that tree, and underneath that tree was a hole. And down below, there was the swift waters that went away. He instructed those 50 warlords to take their weapons of war. They'd walk up to that hole and bury them in the ground underneath that tree of peace. You ever hear that saying, bury the hatchet? Yeah. That's where that comes from. You bury the hatchet of war. So those 50 warlords took their weapons and they buried them underneath that tree. And it's part of our constitution, our leaders are forbidden ever to raise a weapon. And that's symbolic, not only physically, but with words. You don't use threats of violence to get your point across. You know, you never do that. So those chiefs, they took their weapons, they threw them down, and the peacemaker put that tree back, and it washed away those weapons. Up on top of the tree, he pointed, and he saw an eagle land on that white pine. And he says, that eagle will be your guardian. Now that eagle has got keen eyesight and can see for miles. And that eagle will warn us if there's anything cutting those roots or some evil approaching, and he'll warn us. And so they call that the tree of peace. Now in that time, there were 50 chiefs, and they became chiefs of peace. Now each one of them had a name. Now when those 50 chiefs all died in that ancient day, their name went back to their women in their clan. And it was the clan mothers within those clans' responsibility to look to the men within their clan to see a good candidate to take his place, the one that died, to be a chief. Now and the reason is the clan mothers, they know everybody. And they know all the young kids growing up and they see the young men. And if there's a young man that's uh, selfish, and all he thinks about is money, or getting things, or uh, doesn't want to participate in anything. She wouldn't even consider him to be a chief. Another young man growing up, he gives. He's always giving, he helps his grandparents. He sees somebody that needs help, he stops what he's doing, he goes over there. You know, somebody, uh, an elder has uh, two feet of snow on their sidewalk. He goes over there and shovels it, not with his hand out. You know, he does it out of the kindness of his heart. Uh, if he's knowledgeable of our history and our culture, he'd be a good candidate to be a chief because his actions won't be selfish. He'll be thinking about his family and his clan, his nation, and he'll represent us. And so those clan mothers, they look to those young men and they nominate him. 
they'll nominate him and they say there's a word in Mohawk, I can't think of it, but it's they raise him up. In other words, he's almost like put on a pedestal and they all talk about him. Like, you know, maybe there's something about him nobody knows or nobody heard and they discuss his qualities. Maybe he isn't such a great candidate. But all the women within that one clan have to agree. It has to be consensus. If there's one dissenting voice, it doesn't happen. And so it's up to those women to convince that dissenting voice that, to accept it. So it might not happen. Then it goes to the men, same process, then to the nation, then to the Confederacy. And once they, everybody approves, he becomes a chief. And there's a condolence ceremony, that one with the Antwata, with the wampum. That ancient ceremony is still performed, and it's used to put a man into that position of power. And it's a life term for the rest of his life. But some men, even though they might be good, we're humans. You might change. You know, something might make them go a different direction that might be contrary to their family and their nation. So it's up to those clan mothers to warn him that he's not doing his job. And after three warnings, he doesn't correct his actions and doesn't do as his people wish. The clan mother removes him from office. He's impeached. And they put somebody else in his place that will do his job. And so there's a balance here with the men and women. The women, they don't do the speaking in council. The men do. But the women are always there. And they're always present, listening. And if they disagree with it, they send a messenger to that chief. They say, nope, that's not what we want. And so... But that is the very short version of the great law. <laughs> now, that story, like I said, it takes three days. So it's, it's a very important story. And there's songs that are sung, uh, the speeches that are recited word for word. Um, and I tell it in English, but it really should be told in our own language because our language is very symbolic. And there are certain translations that, to an English speaker, that doesn't make sense. You know, there's a, but to a Mohawk speaker, it makes perfect sense. You know, our languages are very different. And so there's written versions in certain books. You know, anthropologists have studied the Iroquois, um, written down stories uh, in English. And to a Mohawk speaker, they says, no, that's not right. You know, it just doesn't make sense. But um, I try to my best of my ability to communicate the basic plot of how that story is. And to give a date on that, there's a, a part of that story among the Senecas where they say that one village of Senecas were very reluctant to accept the great law. <clears throat> and the peacemaker said, look to the sky as a sign. You know, look for a sign in the sky. And so the Senecas waited and waited, and the sun went, came up. And that day, the sun went out. It was a total eclipse of the sun. And they say during that time of year, the corn was just above the knee. It was around that time of year. And they would lived in the Genesee Valley in like Western New York when this took place. And so they estimate, you know, the astrologists have calculated back when, when uh, a total eclipse of the sun in that area was around the year 1,130 something. So this is a pretty old uh, form of government. And they say it's the oldest participatory government in the world. You know, a lot of people point to Greece, but there was only a handful of people that had power or had a voice. And I don't think uh, half of them had a voice because they were women. The women didn't have a voice. But among our people, everybody had a voice. It was, you know, equality among all. But anyways, uh, yeah, that is a, a long story. And, it, you know, I look to, you know, places over in the Middle East, and it reminds me you know, of our stories the way we were. It, sound, it seems like it's endless, it's, you know, it's sad in a way. You know, these young kids growing up, that's all they know, you know. But and I've met uh, at our museum in the mountains, I've met uh, uh, Palestinians that have come and I've told that story. And uh, you can see there's a little glimmer of hope, but it's, you know, for them it's, it's too, it sounds too easy, you know. Um, I've had uh, Israelis there that I've spoken to that same thing. They, they, uh, they, they said certain things that I knew, I was like, oh, you're not ready yet. But, um, but it, you know, I think back that, you know, you get generations and generations of people, that's all they know, and you're able to transform into this, you know, it is possible. And it's still in existence to this very day. So, but anyways, that was my serious story of the night. <laughs> <laughs> now this other story, uh, 
there's a number of stories that I want to tell. But I don't know if I have enough time, but well, this one story, um, like all of my stories, take place long ago. And they say that uh, there's this one village of Iroquois people, and all these longhouses, uh, our houses were long, and um, they went according to our clans, the matrilineal. And um, in our, our way is that the, the women own the home. That's their house. And, and like I said earlier, uh, the children take the mother's name or identity. And so in those long houses, all of the children belong to the female, her, her clan. And so the head of the house, it was a female. That was her home and all the children. We'll say, for example, the, the woman, maybe it's a wolf clan. She has maybe a daughter and a son. Now, when the daughter gets time to get married, the new husband moves in with her and her mother, and they add on to that house, and they start their family there. Now, the, the boy, when he gets old enough to get married, he moves out of his mother's house, and he moves in with his new wife in her house, in her clan, and they add on over there. So if you have a family that has uh, 15 daughters, and they all get married, that's a long house. <laughs> <laughs> and it was... Uh, Archaeological evidence at Onondaga of a longhouse uh, made of bark that was 400 feet long, uh, 40 feet wide. That's pretty big. So it was a big family. And uh, in the event of a divorce, that if they say there was a split in that, that marriage, and it was pretty rare because in our way, we have, they have trial marriages. You know, they, um, they live together for a while, you know, for a few years to see if they're compatible. Because when, they, when people first meet, you know, the fireworks are going off, everything's so nice. But you live together day to day, see how you, after a month or two or a year, see how you, you know, come back to us then, see how you get along. If they get along and they still want to get married, then there's a ceremony where they get married. But if they don't, find somebody else, you know, it's accepted. But if that, in that case, if there was a split for some reason, in that house, the husband would leave with just a shirt on his back and he would go home to his mother in her clan. He'd go back to his mother. No questions asked. And um, a lot of the guys are like, Eesh. you know, like, what do we have? You know, we didn't have the house, we didn't have anything. Well, we have everything else. You know, we have the woods. You know, we go hunting, we fish. You know, and like in my case, I have a garage, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where I hang out. You know? <laughs> but uh, there was a family that was uh, a married couple, and, uh, and they got married in the longhouse, a traditional way. And uh, they, had a, they got a divorce, and they had just built a brand new house. The husband left. There was nothing he could do. And it was on his father's land. And, uh, it was just, that was the way. That's no questions. And you could tell he wasn't happy, but he, he had to move away. And uh, she kept everything. And, um, you know, that's just our way. But anyways, in this one village, there was all these longhouses, different families in this one Iroquois village. And in this village, each house... They had a certain number of dogs. Some had one dog, others had two or three. There were all these dogs all around in this one village. And what people didn't realize is, but in that ancient day, long ago, these dogs, they knew how to speak. They could talk. They didn't talk in front of people, though. They didn't communicate, and they didn't let on that they understood what they were saying. And these dogs, they get bored from time to time, and so they start to cause trouble. And what they would do is maybe they would go over and they'd take somebody's lacrosse stick and they'd, in their mouth, drag it over to somebody else's house and put it in there and wait to see what happens. they say, hey, there's my stick. What are you trying to steal it? Or, uh, you know, do things like that and cause trouble. And, uh, and a lot of times what they would do is they listen. That's all they had to do was listen. So these people in the villages, you know, the, the old men, the old ladies, doing their chores, and the young men, young ladies doing their chores, and the children. There's dogs always present, listening to every word that they said, and they'd soak it all in. The sun would set in the west, and those dogs would get up out of the bark house when everybody's asleep, and very quietly, they'd go outside, and there was a trail in the forest, and it was under these bushes. It was almost like a tunnel went under those bushes, and those dogs would get down on their bellies, and they'd squeeze down, and they'd come out to this trail in the woods, and it would go all around in the woods until this finally came to this little clearing. And all these dogs would do this. They'd follow each other, single file. And then they get to this clearing in the woods, and there was this old dead tree off to the side. 
And they'd walk up to that tree and then they, for some reason, they take their tails off. Nobody knows why. <laughs> but they take their tails off and they'd hang them up in that old tree. Everyone did that. They all had their tails hanging in that old tree. Then they'd sit down and they'd have a meeting. And then one dog would get up and he goes, oh, you should have seen what I did today. It was hilarious. And he said, I took his lacrosse stick and he thought he stole it and they got in this big fight. And they'd all laugh. And another dog got up and goes, you know what? I heard a lot of things about other people. Well, it was gossip is what it was. A lot of rumors. And he says, I heard something about your master, what, what they do in that house. It's, it's not pretty. Let me tell you about it. And he'd explain that, that about what he heard. Then another dog would get up and he says, well, I heard this about your master. And then he'd tell them what he heard. And they'd share notes and they'd tell and they'd spread all that gossip all around. Till so finally they could see the sun was just peeking up over the horizon. Still night. Those dogs are getting tired and they'd walk up to that tree and they'd, oh, there's my tail. And they'd put their tail back on and they'd go back home. Under those bushes and they'd pop out in the village. And they'd go back into the bark house. People are sound asleep. You could hear snoring all across that village. Those dogs, what they did is they walk up to their masters and they'd whisper in their ears. And they'd say, so-and-so said this about you. And so-and-so <laughs> stole their lacrosse stick. Each dog did this in that whole village. And so those people would wake up in the morning, go outside, and they look at their neighbors. He goes, I heard what you said about me. He goes, that's not true. And then that guy would say, I know what you did to my lacrosse stick. You took it. And they might get in an argument. Every single day, those dogs would listen. They'd do little tricks to those people. Those people had no idea what was going on. Every night, those dogs would wait till those people would go to sleep. And they'd go into the forest down that trail, go up to that tree, hang their tails up in that tree, sit down and have their meeting, pass around all that gossip and all that good news all around. Meeting was over, go up to that tree, find their tail, put it back on, head back home, go back into the village, into the longhouse, whisper in their master's ears. Every night they did this, and every morning, those people would wake up with more and more bad thoughts and bad feelings about everybody around them. After weeks and months of this, it got to a point in that village, not one person got along with another one in that whole entire village. Nobody got along anymore. Even the old ladies, they get together, and they'd make those beautiful baskets and they'd talk and look, you know, look at their grandchildren. And they didn't do that anymore. They said, I'm not going over there. They had bad feelings because they talk about me too much. The old men, they get together and they make lacrosse sticks and they didn't do that anymore either. They stayed right at home. Even the kids, they go off and play. They didn't do that. They just, nobody got along. They didn't even like looking at each other. It was that bad. Till finally, this one night, those dogs laid down and they waited. Those people went to sleep. Went down, had their meeting. Meeting was over, put on their tails, headed back home. This one dog was kind of lagging behind and the sun was just coming up and he was, he was falling back a little bit. And it was pretty light out. And uh, he says, I wonder if I should tell him. Ah, he's asleep. He went in there anyway. He walked in, he started whispering in his master's ear about all the stuff he heard. But that dog didn't realize that, but that man was awake. And he looked like he was sleeping. You know, like you wake up in the morning and then you just, oh, I don't want to get up. And you close your eyes. That's what happened to that guy. So that guy was laying there and he hears that whispering in his ear. And he goes, who is this? He goes, and then he listened to what that, those words were. And it was pretty bad, you know, pretty bad stuff what he was saying. And he goes, I bet it's my neighbor. You know, he's a troublemaker, that guy. And so he opened up his eye just a little bit to see who it was. And he looked and he saw the snout of his own dog whispering in his ear. He almost had a heart attack right there. I know I would if I was walking down the street and some dog said, hey, how's it going? Like, you know? <laughs> but that guy, he's like, is this for real? And he kept pinching himself to make sure he wasn't dreaming. You know, just about drew blood. He pinched so hard. He goes, I'm awake, I'm awake. And he looked again, and sure enough, there's this snout of his own dog. Couldn't believe it. And again, he heard what was the words that were being said weren't good. And it dawned on him. They're the ones causing all the trouble. It's not us. It's those dogs. So he couldn't wait to tell everybody, but he had to be calm. So he kept pretending he was asleep until he heard noises and he knew his family was getting up. And around that time, he woke up and he ran to all the bark houses. And he, he says, I got something very important to tell you. Send a representative, one person from each longhouse. I got important news. 
And he goes, we'll go to the east. You go in the sun and straight up. Don't bring your dogs with you. <laughs> and so they were curious what this guy had to say. And so the sun was straight up and those, each delegate from each bark house went down and went to the east. And there was that man waiting. And that man, he told him, he says, these dogs, they know how to talk. And he says, are you sure? He goes, yes, I heard it. He whispered to me last night or early this morning. And the things he said were really bad. And he said things that you said. And he's like, I never said such a thing. And he says, these dogs are the ones that are causing so much trouble. And that's why we're not getting along. What should we do? And so they sat down and they, you could hear mumbling going on and trying to figure out what to do. And finally one guy got out, <clears throat> he cleared his throat and everybody hushed. And he says, well, why don't we just get rid of them? They're troublemakers, they're no good. He didn't think far enough because an old lady stood up and she said, who's going to warn us if there's anything approaching the village? Who's going to help us go hunt? Who's going to help us chase down the deer? He goes, they're part of our family. We need them and they help us. We can't get rid of them. So he's, oh, all right. So he sat down and he started talking some more, mumbling. Finally, another guy got up and he says, well, he goes, why don't we just get switches and whip them? You know, that'll teach them. Same old lady stood up and she says, you hit those dogs. They'll never look at you with friendly eyes again. They'll never stand in front of danger and protect your children. They won't help you. Danger approaches, they'll run away. You know, you, you harm those dogs, it'll be like that. You have to take care of them because that's not going to work. So mumbling, mumbling, they could not figure out what to do. So finally, after about two hours of talking and deliberation, the thing that they all agreed was they were going to scare them. Just scare the daylights right out of them. And they had a plan. So they all went home. And during that day, they did their ordinary business and they watched those dogs out of the corner of their eye. Very careful what they said. And they'd watch those dogs and they could tell they were listening to them. You know, every once in a while their heads would twist like they didn't understand. But they were very careful what they said. And so, the sun went down and all those people started to go to bed, just like they always did every night. All the children laid down. The parents, the grandparents got under the robes and they laid down, closed their eyes. But the men kept one eye open watching those dogs. And they watched after about, about midnight, one o'clock in the morning. They watched those dogs quietly get up, walk out of the bark house, and they disappeared. And when they were out of the bark house, those men jumped up out of bed, and they grabbed these different paints in different colors, and they painted up their faces head to toe. Different designs, big eyes, painted big teeth, and they took their long, long hair, and they took bear grease, and they rubbed it in their hands, and they put it in their hair. That's old uh, Indian gel. Hair gel, it's bear grease. <laughs> they took that bear grease and they put it in their hair and they made it like big horns and spikes and, and some of them just made it so their hair was out to here. One guy took some deer antlers and he put it on his head and he tied it on. And so he's all painted up head to toe, hair out to here, antlers and horns all over the place. They look scary. It was about 20, 20 men dressed up like that. And they watched out, out the door and they saw that last dog go under the bushes into the woods. He says, let's go. And so they lined up and they got down on their bellies and they went underneath those bushes and they started to follow that last dog very quietly. And as they approached, they saw that clearing and they watched that line of dogs go up to that tree and they hung their tails up in that tree. And they says, I didn't know they could do that. <laughs> they said, never mind, we got a job to do. And so they watched as those dogs all hung up their tails and they went in a circle and they sat down and they started talking. And one dog says, well, they're very quiet today. I don't know why. So let's make something up anyway. And so they started to make up all kinds of rumors and gossip. Meanwhile, those men were on their bellies. And they surrounded those dogs. And this is nighttime, remember. And what was the plan was that somebody was to yell out like a whistle and a signal. And that was for all of those 20 men to jump into the middle and to scream at the top of their lungs. Now, if you're in the woods at night, alone and some guy jumped out from behind the tree hair out to here <laughs> antlers all painted up he's probably jump about that high so you imagine 20 of them all painted hair out to here horns antlers everywhere this was gonna be good so those dogs are talking away and making things up and they didn't know those men were right there 
Suddenly that sound was given and those men jumped into the middle, rah, yelling and screaming at the top of their lungs. Those dogs were, ah, cried and screamed, jumped about that high in the air and their legs were moving before they even hit the ground and pew, they took off in all directions. Blindly through the forest, running so fast, they didn't know what those monsters were and they were crying and yipping and crying, running as fast as they were going, their behinds were like this, branches scratching them and then the dog in the front was running so fast, he was so scared, his heart was beating and then all of a sudden he stopped and he was like, felt back, he was like, I forgot my tail. They all forgot their tails. They left them in that tree. They said, we need our tails. So let's get them. Turn around, they ran back. They're still afraid of those monsters. But those guys by then were laughing and it was a funny sight. And those dogs, they didn't even want to look at them. They just knew where that tree was and they made a beeline right towards it. Fast as they could, they ran up to that tree. They didn't even look, just grab any old tail. Throw it on and keep on going. And they all grabbed the wrong tail. Those dogs all. They all got away, and those dogs, they learned their lesson. Today, they don't talk anymore. They don't cause trouble. But if you have dogs at home, and you talk to them, they understand you. You know, like you say, good boy or good girl, you know, they look at you and they're all happy. You know, or you say, who did that on the floor right there? And like, <laughs> they, look, they look guilty, don't they? You know, my mother had this little dog, one of those, uh, like a fluff ball, those um, Pomeranians. You know, this cute little guy, and he was smart. He was so smart that he learned how to spell. Because my mother, she would give him a bath once in a while, and he hated baths. And she'd say, well, it's time to give him a bath. And you look around, where'd he go? You know, he'd disappear under her bed. He's hiding. He wouldn't come out for, until the next day. So finally, they said, well, it's time for a B-A-T-H. He learned that. You know, these things. So they understand what you say, but they, they don't cause trouble anymore. And another thing about dogs that you'll notice to this very day they do this. Whenever two dogs are walking around and they're, they're mingling around other dogs, what do they always do? They always check out. They're looking for their own tails. They grab the wrong one. <laughs> 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 That's the end.